Well, uh, let's hear more from our correspondent now, Paul Adams, who looks back at the life of Alexei Navalny. For years, Alexei Navalny was a thorn in the side of the Kremlin. A lawyer by training, he started out as an anti-corruption blogger. But he shot to prominence in 2011 during protests over parliamentary elections tainted by allegations of fraud. The demonstrations were the largest Russia had seen for years. Navalny was arrested, suddenly emerging as a significant opposition figure. His charismatic presence on the streets soon made him a regular target of the authorities. Alexei Navalny was a strong nationalist, but also a fierce critic of Russia's powerful elites. He developed a huge following on social media, publishing regular investigations into high-level corruption. His popular YouTube channel, with its slick videos, was full of allegations against prominent figures. What we are seeing now is that the Internet is the number one concern for the current regime, and its number one enemy too. His revelations led to official harassment. His offices searched, he and his staff detained. In 2017, he was attacked with green dye, causing damage to his right eye. The following year, he was barred from running for president, manhandled and arrested at a demonstration in Moscow. And in 2020, he was poisoned, falling ill on a flight from Siberia. He was evacuated to Germany for treatment. International chemical weapons experts found traces of the nerve agent Novichok. Navalny survived and accused Vladimir Putin of trying to have him killed. Five months later, Navalny returned to Russia, only to be thrown in jail once more. Protests erupted across the country, fueled in part by publication of yet another video, accusing Russia's president of corruption. Despite a hunger strike and international pressure, Navalny remained behind bars, designated a terrorist and sentenced to long years in prison. Alexei Navalny leaves behind a wife, daughter and son, and a country where opposition has been utterly stifled. Well, that from our diplomatic correspondent, Paul Adams. In a moment or two, we'll talk to the longtime Putin critic, Bill Browder, uh, just establishing the line to him, a few connectivity problems. But uh, let's bring in John Simpson, the BBC's World Affairs editor. Uh, and John, you met and interviewed Alexei Navalny several times, didn't you? Uh, yes, in particular around uh, 2013, which was the kind of high point of his uh, political um, opposition to to the the Kremlin. Uh, he actually got 27 percent of the of the vote in Moscow uh, for the office of mayor, um, and that was under a system where it was really hard for the opposition to rack up votes. And I, I, I spoke to him, I followed him, uh, I watched him, I admired him um, uh, quite a lot. He was a very good uh, public speaker. He knew how to uh, get a crowd worked up in his favour. And, of course, the issue that he concentrated on then and, and ever since was the issue of corruption. Um, he called... Uh, Vladimir Putin, the richest man in the world, which could perhaps possibly be true. He was behind uh, issuing um, 500, I think, photographs of the apparent palace that uh, that Vladimir Putin's built for himself uh, on the Black Sea coast. It's these kind of issues which really disturbed uh, Mr. Putin and the uh, and the Kremlin in general because they know uh, how that plays with ordinary Russians. I mean, most people uh, probably wouldn't support a Navalny in, a, uh, in an election, but they are angered by, by the sense of, of corruption at a time when things were quite hard uh, for, for ordinary Russians. And that was why um, Mr. Putin had to get him arrested, had to silence him. I, I was reminded uh, rather of what happened to Nelson Mandela in South Africa, um, who was kept 
under, under really good conditions for the last sort of 10, 15 years of his uh, time in jail because uh, the South African government knew that at some point it was going to have to negotiate with him. On the contrary, in Russia, uh, Putin knew there was no utter possibility of negotiating with Navalny, so they didn't care how they treated uh, how they treated him. Um, this is this must have come as a as, as as a shock to everybody. I mean, he really did seem to be in reasonable health, even though the camp where he's held is a is a, a, a an appalling one. 40 miles into the Arctic Circle. Nevertheless, he seemed to have the physical resilience to be able to cope with the, with the circumstances there. Clearly, clearly not. And only yesterday I was mentioning that we saw footage of that court appearance from Navalny. He had complained uh, pretty recently, hadn't he, about the conditions he was being held in. That was one of the reasons for his recent transfer, wasn't it? Yes, and, and he complained in particular about being malnourished, um, and he looked malnourished too. Uh, under those circumstances, he was probably eating only about half of the amount that a, a, a healthy adult would need to eat to, to counter the effects of a Russian winter. Um, it's a brutal prison as well. Um, he had a a hard time there, and you can imagine he was probably singled out for particular treatment by by the warders. But nevertheless, he he managed to stand up to it. Whether his health just suddenly collapsed, or whether it's something uh, even more sinister, uh, we can't at uh, this stage know. But I wouldn't be at all surprised if the circumstances do do come out at some stage and. I think the pressure will then be even stronger on Vladimir Putin. And John, what do you make of, of the timing? Because we're only a few weeks away, aren't we, from the latest presidential elections. In some way, this will represent some sort of warning shot, won't it, to, to any sort of criticism or outspoken critics within Russia? Yes, well, of course, I, I mean, we got to be certain in our minds, Matthew, whether uh, there the was uh, some kind of deliberate attempt to silence him permanently or, or whether he just died as a result of the, of the way that he'd been treated. Uh, either could, could be perfectly true. If, if it was a deliberate attempt to silence him before the elections, then, um, I mean, that is, a, of course, a very serious uh, issue. I mean, the fact is that Navalny would have played no part in, in anybody's minds, really, in the, in the election. I mean, he's out of the, was out of the game from the moment that he came back to, to Russia after being treated for the Novichok poisoning in Germany. So it, it, it wouldn't, he's not a, a, a kind of leading influence there. There are very, very few other figures uh, brave enough in Russia to speak out in any way. And we've seen um, several of them being, being jailed over the last few months, so uh, the last year or so. So it, it, this is not, um, uh, I think, an attempt to silence an active opposition. Um, whether it, it's uh, an attempt to say, look, I am all powerful by, by Putin. You can't touch me. You've got to just simply do what I, what I say. Well, I mean, that must be a possibility.